Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us on our last Conservation in the Classroom event of the 2022-2023 school year. My name is Kate, and I will be your host. For today's event, we are commemorating Endangered Species Day, which is actually coming up this Friday on May 19th. In addition to this Friday being Endangered Species Day, 2023 actually marks the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act, which was a law that was passed to help protect at risk species from extinction. So for today's event, we are going to be joined by Noelle Guernsey, who is with WWF's Northern Great Plains team. Noelle is here to share with us a little bit about how a species becomes endangered, what we can do to help them, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her work protecting one of the most endangered mammals in North America. Of course, we are talking about black-footed ferrets. So let's bring Noelle in. Hi, Noelle. Thank you so much for being here. We're so excited to learn from you today. Hi, everyone. So before I officially pass things over to Noelle, of course, as you all know, we need to say hi to our special guests that we have joining us on camera. So first, let's bring in our group from Vancouver, Washington. We have Sarah J. Anderson's Elementary. Hi! hi. hi. Next up from Sacramento, California, we have Natamus Charter School Pact Academy. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, y'all. And last but certainly not least, coming to us from Bloomfield, Connecticut, we have King Bob's All Stars. From the <laughs> Hi. Well, we cannot wait to hear all of your questions. At the end, just a quick reminder to those of you watching the stream online, be sure to place any questions that you have for Noelle in the Google form that you see underneath your video screen, and we'll be sure to incorporate as many of those as we can at the end. So without further ado, Noelle, I think we are ready for you. So if you are ready, you can go ahead and share your screen and get started. Perfect. Well, hi everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today to learn about the masked bandits of the prairie, which is a nickname for black-footed ferrets. And we are meeting today to commemorate Endangered Species Day. So I'm Noelle Guernsey and I am trained as a wildlife ecologist. I've worked with several wildlife species, including this black-tailed prairie dog, the black-footed ferret, and the mule deer that you can see in these pictures, plus many more species. I am a senior specialist in our Northern Great Plains office, which is located in Bozeman, Montana, and I work on our bison and our black-footed ferret programs. A lot of my work involves working with Native nations in Montana and South Dakota to support, work, support their work in restoring species like black-footed ferrets to their lands. I'm really lucky that I get to work with really great and passionate people that are really excited about restoring wildlife and healthy ecosystems. So to start our talk today, let's just talk a little bit about what an endangered species is and how that status is determined. So scientists use assessments to determine how an individual species is doing. This includes looking at their population numbers, their spatial distribution, their habitat, and what threats that species is facing. Based on this information, biologists are able to assess the likelihood that a species could become extinct in the future. A species is considered endangered if it is facing a very high risk of extinction in the wild. In the United States, there are 1,270 endangered species. While only animal species are shown here in these pictures, there are also many endangered plant species. So once biologists understand the unique risks a species is facing, plans can be made to help save these species. Sumatran, orang Sumatran orangutan, hawksbill turtle, and monarch butterflies that are shown here are all facing loss of their very different habitats. Black rhinos are endangered because of poaching demands, and Galapagos penguins are facing um, challenges from climate change, pollution, and bycatch. 
The pallid sturgeon that's listed there uh, is a fish that is threatened by dams that has dramatically reduced their habitat. So these are all examples of different endangered species. So now that we've learned about what an endangered species status is, let's learn more about the mass bandit of the prairie, the black-footed ferret. Black-footed ferrets were first listed as endangered in 1967. And in fact, black-footed ferrets were thought to be extinct in the 1970s. But in 1981, a dog named Shep found a surviving ferret population in Wyoming. In the late 1980s, the last 18 wild ferrets were trapped and taken into captivity to save the species. This was really important because in 1987, the last wild ferret in Wyoming died. So since then, people, including myself, have been working really hard to restore ferrets into the wild. And today there are almost 400 ferrets in the wild, but only 164 of them are adults. The rest of them are young ferrets, which we call kits. We are so glad that there are almost 400 ferrets in the wild, but we have a long way to go to make sure that ferrets are doing well and can be taken off of the endangered species list. Scientists call a species recovered when their populations have increased enough that they are not in imminent danger of going extinct. So many of us are working to increase the number of adult black-footed ferrets to 3,000 individuals throughout their historic range. Let's learn a little bit more about this fascinating species and what we are doing to help increase their populations. So some of you may be familiar with pet ferrets, but that is an entirely different species. The domestic pet ferret is related to the European polecat, which is another weasel species that's found in Western Eurasia and North Africa. The black-footed ferret that you see here is the only wild ferret species that calls North America home. This species is a member of the Mustelid family, and that includes otters and badgers and wolverine. Black-footed ferrets are long and thin animals, and they, you know, are quite small. They only weigh about one and a half to two and a half pounds. The black-footed ferret is nocturnal and is a highly specialized predator. So understanding any species habitat is really key to understanding how to help a species, but it is critically important for endangered species. If you look at this beautiful picture, this is a site called Snake Butte, and it is found on the lands of the Fort Belknap Indian community in Montana. And if you take a quick look, you'll see a bunch of different mounds, and these mounds are burrow entrances for prairie dogs, which live in large colonies in the grasslands of the Great Plains. And this is really essential habitat for black-footed ferrets, because the ferrets live in the burrows that the prairie dogs dig and call it their own home, and they also prey on the prairie dogs for their food. Prairie dogs are considered a keystone species because they play such an important role in the prairie ecosystem. Many animals, including the black-footed ferret, depend on prairie dogs because of the habitat, but also again, because they are the chicken nuggets of the prairie and many animals like to eat them. Because the black-footed ferret cannot survive without prairie dogs, we call them a prairie dog obligate species. Now, black-footed ferrets weren't always endangered. It is believed that 100 years ago that there were more than 100 million acres of prairie dog habitat that may have supported between 500 to 1 million black-footed ferrets. However, prairie dogs have been reduced dramatically due to their habitat being converted to farmland and urban areas, extensive poisoning campaigns, and a non-native disease that is transmitted by infected fleas that was brought over on ships to North America. Black-footed ferret populations simultaneously declined with the loss of prairie dogs to the brink of extinction. So here is a video of a live uh, black-footed ferret. And one of the really important things that we do as scientists is work on reintroducing them. 
So once scientists started re sorry, once scientists trapped those last surviving wild ferrets in Wyoming in the 1980s, they started working really hard to give them a second chance by establishing captive breeding programs that would allow scientists to then release these animals back into the wild. There are many steps to the reintroduction process, and once biologists have assessed that the habitat is good, the captive ferrets can be released. Right now, there are only 15 reintroduction sites that have ferrets. And here, this video is of a ferret that was born in captivity that then went through boot camp, which means that they were able to show that they could hunt prairie dogs and would be able to survive on their own in the wild. And this ferret in particular was one that we released to the Crow Nation in Montana. Here is another video of another ferret that was released to the Crow Nation in Montana by myself and other biologists and partners. You can see their long slinky body and why they're perfectly built to live in prairie dog burrows. We maintain detailed information about which animal is released where and other important data senses such as the size and shape of the prairie dog colonies that provide the ferrets with this habitat that they need. So once you reintroduce black-footed ferrets to site, it's really important to monitor them and to conduct population surveys. It often takes several releases of several ferrets to get a population reestablished, and we need to track how it's doing. So ferrets are nocturnal, which means they are only active at night, which means that we have to work at night. I make sure to drink a lot of coffee on those nights. And ferrets, their eyes give off this bright green eye shine when a spotlight lands on them. So those first two pictures you'll see are of the spotlights, which we use on top of our trucks. Um, and we scan the lands and look for those green eyes popping out of a burrow. After we have found a ferret, we go to that burrow where we see it and we set a trap, which is that tall thing that you see in the picture on the right. That orange box that's hooked up to the trap has a ring reader that you put around the entrance of the burrow. And if a ferret was released from captivity or if it has been trapped before, they will have a microchip, which is similar to the, the type of microchip that we put in our dogs to, in case they get lost. So the microchip gives each individual ferret a unique ID number, and it allows us to know exactly who that animal is. The orange box will read their microchip if they have one when the ferrets run up into the trap, and then there's a door that shuts behind them. So after you set a trap, you leave and you come back to see if you were lucky enough to catch one. So this is an example of a ferret that was born in the wild, which means this ferret did not have a microchip. And so I needed to bring this ferret back to the hospital trailer where this ferret was then put under anesthesia. Once anesthetized, they receive their microchip and vaccines to protect them from, from disease. They receive vaccines to protect them against salvatic plague and also canine distemper. And then we weigh them and measure them to keep track of their growth, just like your doctors do for you. If any of you students are interested in technology, you'll be excited to learn that many people are using the quickly advancing world of technology to conserve endangered species. One way that we often assess ferret habitat is by using ATVs to map ferret habitat with the use of GPS units. I've even had to do this on foot and it can take a really, really long time. And so several partner organizations, including World Wildlife Fund, are working to test the use of unmanned aerial systems, which is a drone, and the use of these drones to do habitat mapping. So this drone here in the picture in the left flew over thousands of acres of prairie dog habitat and collected images. Then you train a computer that can then estimate the size of the colonies and thus the habitat for ferrets. The way that we train the computer and test it is we um, 
is shown in that top right picture, we ground truth it to test to, to make the images line up. And then this background picture that you see is what those photos that the drone take look like. If you look closely, you'll see a lot of prairie dog burrows. And I wonder if any of them have a ferret inside of them. Another technology tool that we are testing with partners is seeing if special cameras can help us find ferrets. Thermal cameras detect the body heat of the ferrets, which is really helpful. If you remember earlier, I was showing you spotlights and you really have to make sure that the ferret is looking at you and you hit it with the light and you see it. So it can take quite a lot of time. But with these cameras, if they can just sense the body heat, it would be really helpful for us. In this picture, you can see four animals that are showing up in the camera and are highlighted by the red. We are testing different kinds of these thermal cameras, and some of them are mounted on towers, and one is being tested on a drone. So in addition to the, you know, techno testing new technology to help detect and protect ferrets, another activity that needs to happen every single year is protecting the ferrets' habitat. Now, prairie dogs, like these black-tailed prairie dogs that are shown in this picture, and ferrets do not have natural immunity to sylvatic plague. And so it's really critical that we A, provide vaccinations to the ferrets like we talked about, but B, also killing the fleas that transmit that disease. And so every year, ferret reintroduction site managers coordinate the use of specialized insecticides that are put into or near the prairie dog burrows. These prairie dog uh, pups that you see were part of a colony that I worked with in Colorado, and we made sure to protect their burrows from plague. So I hope that you leave today with an appreciation for the black-footed ferret, one of America's most endangered mammals. You've learned about some of the work that goes into the recovery of black-footed ferrets. The most important takeaway for any endangered species is to learn more about why are they endangered? You know, for ferrets, it's really that they need more habitat, which means they need more prairie dog colonies and they must be protected from diseases. By learning what challenges each species face, then you can take action to support those species. The other important lesson is that all species are part of a complicated ecosystem. So the loss of a single species will have rippling effects. Now, sometimes it can be overwhelming and even a little sad to think about endangered species but there are really great conservation success stories that show what can happen if people work together to save species that are endangered. For example, the grizzly bears that are found near my home in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem were down to a low of 136 bears in 1975. Today, there are over a thousand bears in that same population, like this female sow that had two cubs with her when I saw her. Another really great example is that in the 1960s, nesting bald eagles were down to about 480 in the lower 48 states of the U.S. Today, there are over 14,000 breeding pairs of them, thanks to people understanding what was causing their populations to decline and acting on that information. Now, the picture on the right shows a young child who is helping release a black-footed ferret into the wild. And there are so many things that you can do to help endangered species. And like we've talked about before, you know, really learning about the species that are threatened and endangered and why their populations are challenged is an opportunity to learn more about the species, not only just in the United States or North America, but also the ones that are in your backyard and in your states. Once you learn that, you know, sharing that information with your friends and family is a really great way to help. Being conscientious about our resource and energy use is helpful for the planet in general. And you can also write letters to your local uh, representatives that will show that local people care about their wildlife and their ecosystems. 
And if you want to learn more about species, there's many um, helpful websites on our World Wildlife Fund site, so feel free to check those out. And also, you know, you're all students, and I want you to remember as you grow up and go through school that if you have an interest in endangered species, there are so many different jobs in conservation for you. You know, if you like to write, or if you like to take photos, or if you want to make maps or work with the wildlife species directly, there are so many opportunities and we need as many bright minds and passionate people as possible. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much for spending your time with me and learning more about the Black-Footed Ferret for Endangered Species Day. Thank you so much, Noelle. That was fantastic. We are going to move to the question and answer part of the program now. So we will start with our groups that are on camera and then we'll ask a few questions that were submitted from viewers on our website. So any last questions for Noelle, be sure to put them in the form if you're watching from the webpage and our class is here. Make sure when it's your turn that you get up right in front of the camera and ask your question nice and loudly. So we're going to start with Miss Koval's class in Vancouver. If you guys are ready, you're up first. What is your first question for Noelle? Nice and loudly, please. Um, my question is, how are black-footed ferrets important to the food chain and the ecosystems around them? Yeah, thank you. That's a wonderful question. So, you know, any ecosystem is really important to have these different trophic levels is what we call them. And so, Black-footed ferrets play a really important role being predators. And so the black-footed ferrets, you know, they prey on the prairie dog populations. And so that's a really key role that carnivores can play is by preying on herbivore species like prairie dogs. And then there are other larger carnivores that also will prey on ferrets sometimes. So we have documented that that um, great horned owls and coyotes and other predators sometimes use ferrets as their own food too. Okay, that was a great first question to kick things off. Let's go to our group in California, not almost charter school. If you're ready, nice and loudly for us. I have a, my question is what caused the black-footed ferrets land to dress and uh, what caused the population to drastically decrease? Yeah, thanks for that good question. Basically, you know, in the last hundred years, a lot of prairie dog populations have, have declined. Actually, prairie dogs are only found today in about 2% of their historic range. And so as we lost prairie dogs due to lands being converted to farmland or where cities and towns are, also, you know, there were poisoning campaigns to get rid of prairie dogs. And um, then, like I mentioned, there's a non-native disease that came over in the early 1900s on ships. And those were those um, that disease came over and infected fleas that were on rats. And as that disease has made its way west into the black footed ferrets range, that has also really challenged prairie dog populations and ferret habitat. OK, let's go to our King Bob All Stars out in Connecticut. You are up next. What is your first question? Why are prairie dogs 90% of the black blue bear's diet? That's a great question. You know, black-footed ferrets are an example of a highly specialized predator. So they evolved with prairie dogs and that has become their one, you know, their main diet source. Typically they, uh, prairie dogs make up at least 90%, if not more of their diet, although they will be opportunistic and take a mouse or some other small mammal that might, might be in their path. Other species of carnivores like coyotes are more of generalists, which means that they are able to eat many different food sources. So the ferret just happens to be a really, really specialized carnivore. Okay, we are going to ask some questions that were submitted on the website now, Noelle. Um, we got a good question here from Blake out in Mill Valley. Blake wanted to know, 
Prairie dogs give black-footed ferrets food and shelter. Do the black-footed ferrets give prairie dogs anything in return? So if you could talk a little about their relationship. Yeah, that's a really great question. You know, the only thing that I can say is that the ferrets that the ferrets definitely keep prairie dogs on their toes. But, you know, ferrets are quite small. And so prairie dogs, they do put up a good fight. But you're right, the ferrets, you know, they live in their burrows, they eat them in their burrows. And so it's definitely a situation where um, black tailed prairie dogs you know, they have many predator species. And one thing that's pretty interesting is that black, or sorry, prairie dogs have a really complicated language. And so they have different words to communicate with each other about the different predators and threats that are out there. So they have a word, you know, for ferrets, they have a word for badger. Um, and so my, my long rambling answer to your question is, the ferrets definitely benefit more from the prairie dogs and the prairie dogs benefit from the ferrets. Another good question that we had come in online, which I think a lot of people I know I was curious about too, is from Addie in Spring Green, Wisconsin. Addie wanted to know how big are black-footed ferrets compared to prairie dogs? I think it's odd to picture them being the predator when they don't seem that much bigger. So if you could talk a little about that. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, one of the reasons why mustelids like ferrets and um, otters and all of these other weasel species are so amazing to me is that they are just amazing predators. One thing that you'll find interesting about black footed ferrets is that they have very, very long canines and proportionate to their skull size, they actually have the longest canines of any predator species. So it really makes them efficient at being able to hunt prairie dogs. Now, in terms of size, they're really bit, built very different. You know, ferrets, as you saw in those videos and pictures, they're really long, thin, and slinky. And and prairie dogs, you know, they tend to be a little bit of more of a round, <laughs> round animal. But prairie dog pups are quite small. And so those often are pretty important prey species for the black footed ferrets. And also remember that the ferrets are nocturnal. And so they are hunting prairie dogs while they are asleep down in their burrows. So that does help give the ferrets a little bit of an advantage there. Okay, let's start up with another round of questions from our on-camera classes here. So we'll go in the same order. We'll start back up with our group from Sarah J. Anderson Elementary out in Washington. What is your next question? So our class read how cloning has been used to restore ferret populations. How many ferrets have been cloned? That is a really great question. So Elizabeth Ann is probably the ferret that you have heard about. And you are right that people are working on cloning ferrets to see if they can, you know, basically come up with a ferret that's resistant to plague and can maybe help um, also expand some of the genetic diversity of ferrets. If you'll remember, I said that there were very few wild ferrets that were left um, or that were found and brought into captivity, but not all of those ferrets that were brought into captivity successfully reproduced. And so there's a lot of interesting things that people are doing to try to help increase genetic diversity, see if there's a, a potential for a plague resistant ferret. But at the end of the day, you know, ensuring that there's enough habitat in the wild is what's really, really important um, to make sure that there's a place for ferrets and, and helping their population numbers. Okay, next up, our group from California, our packed academy here, nice and loudly for us. Do black-footed ferrets live in one habitat or do they live all over the world? That's a great question. So black-footed ferrets historically have been found throughout the prairie dog range, which is exclusive to North America. Now prairie dogs can be found in parts of Canada, the United States and Mexico. And so black-footed ferrets are a North American species. All right, King Bob All-Stars, you are up next. What is your next question for Noel? Uh, my question is, why do you want us to help save them? 
Sorry, can you say that one more time? Why do you want us to help save them? You know, I think one of the best things you can do is just learn about the different wildlife species that many people may not know about. I feel like a lot of people are um, very familiar with rhinos and tigers and all of these species that need our help. But oftentimes these smaller ones that are less known like the black-footed ferrets don't get the same kind of attention or maybe support from the public as, as all species. And I think with any species, if you can, if you start to learn about that individual animal, you find out all of these cool facts that really shows why they are so unique and amazing and why it would be a sadder world without black footed ferrets. You know, if you think about some of the uh, famous species that have gone extinct, like the passenger pigeon, the dodo bird, you know, that is a loss for the world that no one will be able to replace. So I think we have a really great chance right now with endangered species to, to galvanize as much support and get people excited about these animals. And also understanding that by having endangered species, it also means that that habitat and those lands and waters are really healthy. And that's really important for humans too. So having healthy ecosystems means healthy lands, which means healthy wildlife populations, and that translates to healthy conditions for humans too. Okay, let's go back to the questions that were submitted online. So we had a question come in from Arabella in Suffolk, Virginia, that wanted to know, how do the ferrets behave when you first release them? Yeah, so ferrets, um, that's a really good question. You know, one of the reasons why releasing them into the wild is such a unique experience is it's actually daytime, so you can see them. You know, oftentimes, because they're nocturnal, they're really hard to see. Now, as you saw in those videos, uh, those were a couple of individuals that were pretty curious and actually wanted to kind of explore around and even come out of the burrow, and you saw some of their um, movements that they make. and Typically, you know, you might have a few that are brave like that, but many of them, you release them and they go straight down into a prairie dog burrow and you do not see them again until you're spotlighting for them in the future. But I will say that if you have the opportunity to see a ferret or even Google some of the videos, fer black-footed ferrets are really fascinating. They make all of these different vocalizations. They're really noisy. And they also do this thing called the black-footed ferret dance. And I know there's really great videos out there where it'll show them just dancing and partying on the prairie. Okay, I think we all have our homework now to look for that. Um, we, we had a few questions come in um, from a group in Ronert Park. Um, I'm going to apologize if I mispronounce that. But um, one question, maybe we can kind of combine two here. So one question they had was, why exactly do their eyes glow when the light is shined on them? That was from Natalie. And then we also had a question come in from Eric that was wondering, why exactly did people want to kill off prairie dogs? Yeah, so the green eye shine is from, there's a membrane in some animals' eyes called a tapetum lucidum. And all of the animals that we see out on the prairie at night, they all do give off a certain glow. But the black-footed ferret in particular has this really emerald green shine to it that, you know, that stands out a little bit more from the eye shine of other animals. But the other thing that we do while we're spotlighting that I didn't talk about is as we're shining our spotlight, looking on the prairie for these ferrets, we also have our binoculars. And so you can also, you know, take a look and just confirm that it's a black-footed ferret that you're seeing. Um, and so, yeah, it's the eye shine as well as the location and kind of the behavior of the animal that helps clue you in that it's a black-footed ferret. And then for the other question in terms of why people have um, eradicated prairie dogs, you know, a lot of it has been, um, you know, people have been concerned that the presence of prairie dogs will be problematic. You know, some people feel like it might be problematic for agricultural land use 
or for the expansion of cities and urban areas. And, you know, prairie dogs, they do live in big, large colonies. And so they need a lot of space. But prairie dogs are such a keystone species with over 100 other wildlife species, including black-footed ferrets that benefit from their presence. And so for the remaining prairie dog habitat that we have, it's really important to try to support and protect those areas so that the suite of wildlife species that are found with prairie dogs, like the black-footed ferret, can continue to thrive. Okay, I, we have time for one last round of questions. So for our groups on camera, this will be your last question for Noel. So we'll start back up with our group from Vancouver, Sarah J. Anderson Elementary. Last question. So um, when you release the black-footed ferrets, do you leave food for them? Do you do a soft release when releasing them? You know, the ferret releases that I've been involved with, no, we do not do soft releases. Um, we, you know, I mentioned that the ferrets that are released from captivity have to go through a ferret boot camp. And that really is where they show that they can hunt prairie dogs successfully on their own and don't rely on their mother to provide meat or, or anything like that. And so once we release the ferrets in the wild, you know, we, we wish them luck and know that they have the hunting skills that they need to survive on their own. Okay, Natamas Charter Academy in Sacramento. What is your last question? How long did it take for you guys to find ferrets? That's a good question. So there are often nights where you might go out spotlighting all night long and you don't find a single ferret. There's other times where you might go out and you might have a lucky night and be able to see several ferrets in a row. And so it really kind of depends. Um, oftentimes we time it with moon cycles and try to um, know times of year where ferrets will be active and more likely to be seen. Um, so I hope that that, that helps. Okay, and last but not least, King Bob All-Stars in Connecticut. What's your last question for Noel? My question is about monarch butterflies, another endangered species. We are watching monarch butterfly cat caterpillars right now in our class. Is this helping the species? That's a really great related question. You know, when I said at the end, learning about the endangered species that are in your area, monarch butterflies are a really perfect example. You know, monarch butterflies are another species that are having problems because of loss of habitat. And so I think, you know, the fact that you are learning about them in class is wonderful and it's providing you with the information and probably the tools to help them. You know, Monarch butterflies are similar to black-footed ferrets that they are very specialized in their diet. And so the presence of milkweed is what really is needed to help monarch butterflies. And I'm sure that you're learning all about that in your class. So kudos to you and your class for learning more about monarch butterflies and what you can do to help their populations. Okay, we're going to sneak in just a couple more that got submitted online before we wrap up. So we have Miss Jones's class out in Illinois that wanted to know, for starters, how large or how long can ferrets grow and if you are allowed to keep them as pets? Black-footed ferrets are not, um, not allowed to be a pet species. Um, as I said, they're a different species than the domestic than the domestic ferret. And um, sorry, I'm forgetting what the first part of that question was, was how long they are or how big they are, I believe. Um, and they are, uh, you know, about two, one and a half to two feet long, including their long tail. And they weigh about one and a half to two and a half pounds. Okay. And our last question here, we had a question come in from Bridget in Orlando that was kind of curious, what did you go to school for to get your position at World Wildlife Fund? 
Yeah, thanks, Bridget. You know, I went to college. Um, originally, I wanted to be a veterinarian. And then I took a conservation biology class and realized that I could work with wildlife species. And so I um, did my undergrad degree in ecology and evolutionary biology. And then I took a few years off and worked and traveled and then went back to graduate school to get my master's degree in biology, where I was studying moose in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Okay, well, I appreciate you being here with us here today, Noelle. I think we all learned a lot about endangered species and black-footed ferrets. So if you all still have questions for Noelle that we didn't have time to get to today, you can email them to wildclassroom at wwfus.org, and we'd be happy to pass those along to Noelle. And I'm sure all of you will do your best to learn about endangered species, especially in your regions as we come up on Endangered Species Day this Friday. So. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you again, Noel. We're gonna bring in everyone just one last time to say goodbye and we will see everybody next week.